Lovely. Well, Eves, thank you so much for joining us and, and welcome. We're, we're so thrilled to have you as an organisation that is so passionate about cinema and the people that put it on and also the films and you as a storyteller. Um, well, thank you. I've been excited to watch this film for about a year. I remember mm -hmm. the still um, used for the film of the, the, the black and white ball and thinking, oh, this is a side of Capote I kind of don't know about. I'm really deep mm -hmm. into the Southern Gothic early Capote type work. And I wondered if you could tell me what your relationship um, was with his work before you even embarked on thinking about the film. A great question. I, I grew up uh, in part in Northern Florida, which is South Georgia in the US, so very Southern. And so um, I grew up with his work in that Southern Gothic style. Um, and it was just work that spoke to me. And I think I was probably 12, if I remember correctly. And I had a librarian who introduced me. I, in my mind, she introduced me to Miriam, the short story. And then from there, I just kept reading um, and reading Capote, certainly. But that was my first kind of remembrance. And, you know, it, again, you, you describe it perfectly when you talk about Southern Gothic, because where I grew up, you could, I knew those characters and those eccentric Southern, Southern ways. And so it spoke to me in a very real, uh, in real time. That's great. I love that librarian put you on to. She did. It, yes. It, Mrs. Cor Mrs. Korst. <laughs> Big shout out to Mrs. Korst. You've, you've created <laughs> something really amazing here. That, that's wonderful to, to know. And I'm sure you've been asked about the tapes an awful lot, but they are just so intriguing. So I wonder yeah. if you could tell us a little bit about kind of how you came across them and also a bit um, about the process of ha ha to decide which ones to include and which ones to not. Yeah, you know, the tapes, we had a, a family friend who, who had been quite friendly and very close to uh, George Plimpton. And as I was working on this, I obviously had George's book, um, with me everywhere and you know annotated and earmarked and you name it and he said you know you should speak to his widow and and he connected me with Sarah and Sarah and I spent uh, a lot of time speaking and getting to know one another and she said you know I think I might have some tapes of George's I might have those tapes somewhere and and she found them kind of in, in different batches along the way and uh yeah it, it was just such a and she was so generous and said well here and so we you know, I got the tapes and then obviously we had them transcribed and also had the, the tapes digitized. And, and then it just became this amazing journey of listening to, uh, listening to George, you know, interview these, you know, everyone that was still living and hearing um, not just the, the, the anecdotes and the stories about Truman, but also, you know, you get a bit of the character of the people certainly on the tapes and some of my favorite things which which aren't in the film are you'll hear George saying um oh gosh is it on is it on I don't know if this machine is on and then you'll hear someone else say oh George darling fix me another drink you know <laughs> so it's it's uh they really I was well into the project but they really the tapes and 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 Sarah Plimpton and the Plimpton family's generosity really offered a wonderful um a much fuller story uh, than I could have told without them. Yeah, I, I, I totally hear you about the, the character and, and the cadence of just voices, even though it wasn't that long ago, was so different then. Totally, And, and particularly totally. for that very New York literary scene that we see so much. And I wondered if that, the, the, the format of a tape itself and what we get with that, both the time period, the cadence and the tape hiss, influenced the style of the film because the film really does have this feel like you're walking down these same streets and you're talking to these people at these cocktail parties almost. Yeah, no, that's, I, I did. I really wanted to give the sense that, uh, I wanted to put people in the moment as much as possible. And, and I didn't want it to seem too much of an era by of a bygone era, even though it certainly is, but I wanted to try and drop people in. And I, and I, and I think the tapes and certainly, um, you know, some of the, the live interviews, you know, I think for me, John Richardson was such a special interview. 
um, because John's stories, because at the time, I think John was maybe 94 when I interviewed him. And so his stories were really these amazing remembrances of like, where he was in his life at that moment and Truman just happened to be there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I was hopeful that we might take the viewer on this journey with us and let them feel like they were, you know, having a cocktail or having a cup of tea with John or whatever the case may be. So it felt a little more, um, a little more interactive and a little less distanced than, than it could have, than the film I think could have felt. Yeah, I think one of my favorite things about the film wasn't this kind of tell all ABCD of Capote's life only from kind of talking heads remembering. I like that it was a mix. It's a mix of people who were still living and have been incredibly touched by Truman and his life and also the tapes. And I, I love that juxtaposition as well because what I love when you're hearing these various accounts of Truman Capote is one minute you're getting things like, oh, it, 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 he was Proustian with his next novel. And in the, ne in the next breath, someone's calling him a shit stirrer. Exactly. And I, and I think that is a really just a wonderfully edited to kind of talking or, or spe speakers there with these very varying accounts. And it's almost Capotean how you've kind of gone and found this story. So what was it, was there anything that surprised you Obviously you're a fan of him and you read a lot about him that when you were on this journey that you discovered that was a bit surprising to you. You know, I think the most surprising to me was Kate Harrington, who is, you know, essentially his adopted daughter. And Kate was really surprising to me. And I think she, at the end of the day, for me, she became the heart and soul of the film because, um, you know, as I did all this reading and research and, and I, I, you know, I dug deep, you still got a sense, or I still got a sense that Truman was, you know, a little bit of a, you know, it was the rapier wit. We knew he had the great intellect, but he was also a bit of a mean queen for lack of a better term. And I have always believed that people who, who have, people they mentor, whether they, you know, have a family, have kids, whether that, however that family is created, whether it's friends or biologically or adoption or whatever the case may be, I always find that my first inclination, no matter what the world may say about that individual, my next inclination is always to look at their children and say, how did they turn out? Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting because as soon as I met Kate, and as soon as we started spending quite a bit of time together and talking about Truman, and then one day she said, you know, I really do consider him my father. Mm. And I thought, okay, here's someone who took her from th the age of basically 13 onward. And then I had to step back and say, okay, what did that mean for an openly gay man at the time who could not create a family, but who still wanted a family and had to create his own version of a family, especially given the fact that he had been an orphan and so many different things. And so that made me feel like I was seeing into another side of Truman that I hadn't seen on a talk show or read in an interview or, and then kind of being able to pull back the layers and, and understand what a, what a pioneer in many ways he was, certainly for, for the LGBTQ plus community in creating that family when he was basically being told he couldn't have it. Yeah, it is amazing the kind of um, life he carved out for himself with very unapologetically. And, and that's mm -hmm. not to say it didn't come without a cost. I think we can obviously see he has an enormous cost. Um, yeah. I agree. I think Kay Tarrington was one of the highlights of the film for me because I really didn't know that side. I really didn't know that side of, well, I didn't know Truman as a celebrity, is it? Well, I only really knew his writing and his story. Right. It was so wonderful to see that side, which is obviously probably the most kind of sacred and held to your chest. It's your family life. And yes. 
she was just um, amazing. I thought she was incredible how she didn't really shy away from these other sides of Capote learning about that work, you know, where he's battling some demons or he, he, his behavior might not have been, you know, the most well received. And obviously she confronted a lot of things with her own biological father. And I just thought that was just, every time she spoke, I was on the edge of her every word. So that was- Well, brilliant. I'll tell you though, I'll tell you one thing that's not in the film that I think is really special is that she has two children, but her eldest daughter is named Truman. Oh, really? That really, that's and so she's a, I think Truman's 21 now, but she has a 21 year old named Truman. And so it's a very, um, it's very special. That speaks volumes, obviously, to, to yeah. the legacy he's left behind for her. And exactly. There's an enormous amount of love in Truman Capote. You can see that from the people that are talking about him. And you can really feel it from his writing. And I remember I've, I listened to an interview that you've done with somebody else and you talked about how you never really saw Truman Capote. He never, his name came, came to mind as like a gay icon or a queer icon in the way that other names might come ahead. And really, obviously, he um, was, which is so strange because he's, to me, his writing is inherently queer in so many different ways. Yes. And I just wonder totally. what that was like, kind of seeing him in that light as you came to learn more about him. Yes, it, it was I was eye opening. It was a revelation because obviously I knew he was gay and I mm. but I didn't think about and I think the great author Colm Toybean um, in the film really says, you know, there were these different sides to him and he was always having to play a role and maneuver and and I think it's really, I think, you know, look, the, the two feature films that had been on Truman, uh, Capote with Philip Seymour Hoffman and Infamous with uh, Toby Jones, which were both very well received and I think great films. Um, you know, both tackled the his queerness vis-a-vis -vis being in the midst of Kansas and, you know, in this moment. But I also think one of the things that fascinated me was his openness and his his very unapologetic reality of his sexuality, but also vis-a-vis -vis his friends in this era, um, you know, in, in association with the Swans and these incredibly wealthy and powerful men who were not accustomed to being around, you know, a, a gay a gay person, you know, let alone someone who was as out as Truman was. And I think it's a, uh, it, it really was a revelation in the sense that he hasn't had his due. I don't think Truman has had his due also, frankly, as an author or um, as, a, as, as a gay, um, I don't know if icon is the right word, but certainly as a gay pioneer, mm -hmm. because as an author, I think he was too, he was too celebrated, he was too much of a celebrity mm -hmm. to kind of in many ways be taken seriously as an author, which is unfortunate because the idea that he never received the Pulitzer Prize, I mean, like how could, how is it possible that In Cold Blood didn't receive the Pulitzer Prize? That's a snub, that's not, it has nothing to do with the, the, the quality of the content of the material. And so I think that's an interesting thing. And I think in terms of gay history, he's been largely overlooked because Perhaps for a while he seemed too gay. Perhaps uh, for a while the celebrity and the bitchiness seemed a little too much. It was like, let's pick someone who's a little more, you know, serious. Um, and so I think one of the things that I really hope this film does is A, I, I hope it gets people back reading Capote. I think everyone needs to give another round of, of, of reading. Um, and two, I really hope it brings him out of the shadows a bit more and really back. And I hope, you know, history allows future generations to see him not just as a great writer, but also as a really groundbreaking, um, you know, uh, Act, you know, if not activist, but groundbreaking person in the in the queer movement. Yeah, I hope so too. And and you can see that the way it's almost like even though he's, he was extremely expressive, and you know, to some people, very obviously, 
you know, expressing his sexuality and, and which is great. It, it's, he kind of did lots of things subtly in different ways that were, which were maybe the kind of public didn't see it as serious or kind of important. Yes. But his writing is, I feel like he's always kind of defending the people on the fringes in all kind of walks of life. Always. He's such an, a remarkable degree because it's coming from inside of it's his own. It's coming from inside. That's yeah. right. That's right. I, th I think what was um, really great is one of the first kind of tapes that gets played in the film is Lauren Bacall and her account, which I'm a massive Lauren Bacall fan. So it was just like, oh, oh my gosh, he really was in all corners of, of high yeah. society. And just hearing someone of her stature talking about how enchanted she was with him and by him and, and his effect on the room, I think speaks volumes. So I just, I applaud you for, for including, no. including that. No, it does though. It does speak volumes. It really does. Were there any voices on the tapes or even people you met who, who were a talking head of today um, that you were especially drawn to, whether it's the stories or just the way that they spoke? You know, on the tapes, I have to say, uh, Dotson Raider, who is, I think, one of the, the cleverest uh, people around, um, because Dotson was very, uh, you know, he's much younger than Truman, and he was really, um, and he's a wonderful writer, and he was really nurtured and kind of taken, both Tennessee Williams and Truman both took Dotson under their wing um, as a young writer and were very generous with him. So the stories that he has about both of them, both separately together um, are really rich and the way, and he's such an extraordinary storyteller that um, I was immediately, you know, I, I'm always, enthralled when I get to spend time with him because he just kind of wraps you up in in his storytelling um and also certainly you know I think John Richardson who's who's passed away is, it was an extraordinary uh raconteur also and then I think someone who really was very special for me because I'd known her for for many years is, is this woman Sally Quinn who's a great journalist in Washington DC and was a journalist for the Washington Post for, uh, for, for a long time. And, and Sally is a wonderful blend because she blends truly understanding society and kind of, and high society and what that meant then as, it does, as what it means now and where Truman fit into that puzzle and what it meant. And I think even in the film, she says something like, you know, there was no question the word pansy was flying around these houses so often, and yet Truman was slotted in to dinner almost every night. And so I think Sally um, offered a, a really crucial insight into what it meant to be him within those circles at that point in history. So it was really important. Yeah, I find that very helpful for contextualizing some some of the kind of yeah. deeper levels and not just kind of our, our base knowledge of, of this world. Um, totally. If, if you could pick a time of one of these amazing worlds Capote inherited and you could be there and he was there, what, what would it be? Would it be the Studio 54 years, the, the ball, or maybe even the really early years? Ooh. What a terrific question. I actually think I'd go for the really early years. I, I have to tell you, I think I'd want to see, I think I'd want to see Truman and Harper Lee as little children in Alabama. Uh, and what, because so much of who he, like all of us, you know, uh, we are formed you know, we're the, as my great grandmother used to say, we're the sum total of our life's events, but there's no question that those early years weight a bit heavier because they are the formative years in who we become. And I think, you know, A, for one small town to have two extraordinary authors, I mean, To Kill a Mockingbird with Harper and, you know, In Cold Blood and Breakfast at Tiffany's and so much more with Truman is kind of extraordinary because the town is tiny. So, you know, I mean, that's the beginning. And as I did a lot of research, I was amazed at 
at this town, at how he grew up with, with his two older cousins, kind of raise, well, raising him and his mother pretty much being absentee and father not really showing up. And so he had Harper Lee and she had him. And they also were very close. Um, obviously this was a, an era of, of, in America, certainly of, of racial segregation, but he talked a lot and wrote about how growing up, they often played with the black kids mm -hmm. because the two of them were also kind of other. But, you know, yes. they were these other kids. And so they were like, well, we didn't have a problem playing with the black kids. They were like, you know, they were our friends and we, that's who we played with. And so I think it would be interesting to go back and spend a little bit of time watching um, and taking a real look re in real time at the two of them and her father and, and her mother who, I'll just tell this quick anecdote. So Truman, you know, I always say to people, Truman has, Truman's entire career from beginning to end was based on taking real life people and extrapolating and building upon their story. And unfortunately there, there are places where he hit it perfectly like Breakfast at Tiffany's where even though you had all of these women at the end saying, oh, you know, it was based partially on me or, you know, it was based on me. And then you, of course you read it and you think, well, who would be screaming that, you know, this was based on them and yet at the end of his life, which is basically, he wasn't doing anything different. Answered Prayers was taking real life people. It was what he'd always done, what he did in his interview with, with uh, Marlon Brando, or Marlon basically never did an interview again, you know, in, 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 in Answered Prayers, extrapolating on these lives with truth and then layering over uh, certainly fiction and creativity. But when he was a little boy, he wrote a, uh, a newspaper story that he won, I think first or second prize for called Mrs. Busybody. And it was about this woman in town who sat on her front porch and all she did was observe what everyone else was doing and then talk about it and gossip and so forth. And Mrs. Busybody was based on Harper Lee's mother. Oh, cool. So, and he got in terrible trouble with his aunts <laughs> and, you know, uh, but, but, you know, from beginning, to end, you know, that was him at, I don't know, nine or 10, but the writing and the work progresses and it gets more brilliant, obviously, and it grows. But again, when we go back to the core being of who he was at the end of his life at 60 and who he was at 59 and who he was at the beginning of his life, the fundamentals remain the same. So I think it would be really interesting to be there for the early years. Fantastic answer. I couldn't agree more. If there was any kind of part that I'm still left to want to see is, is his and Harper Lee's friendship, because I think yeah. it's just so incredible. And I love how they've both done homages to one another in yes. their books. Obviously with To Kill a Mockingbird, The Little Boy Next Door is, is Truman based. And in, yes. I think in Other Voices of the Other Room, the rooms. Still Little yeah. Girl is based on yeah. Harper Lee, which yes. I found so fascinating because I feel like we know less about her, really. Um, yes, we yeah. do, yeah. I think that's fantastic. Before all the pandemic happened and everything, I wondered if you had chance to screen the film to an audience in a cinema and what was that experience like? Yes, you know, we premiered the film at the Toronto Film Festival. Um, and so that was really extraordinary. And we had a, several screenings there. And so that was really my first time being in it with an audience. Um, and also that first screening was also the first time that um, that uh, Kate Harrington saw it because she came out to Toronto. And so that was also nerve wracking sitting next to her thinking, oh my God, what's she gonna feel about this? Um, it was extraordinary and it was really nice to see it's, you know, it, it's nice, it's nice when people, you know, laugh at the places you hoped they'd laugh or are silent at the places you, you prayed they would be silent. Um, so it was an extraordinary adventure. And then we were lucky because before pandemic, I did get to go to, to several other uh, live festivals where I had the audience experience and then kind of in the midst of all of that, you know, we were uh, like the rest of the world, the world came to a bit of a pause. But I think the way, um, both festivals as well as other organizations and, and so forth have, have adapted to 
to the digital process of this has been brilliant because it's what we have to do and in many ways i mean i certainly am craving being back in a cinema um but in many ways it is also and i think we have to, we're gonna have to look at this moving forward it is democratizing for people who can't make it somewhere to have access um to have access to to to, to cinema and 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 storytelling so i'm disappointed, but I'm also really, really hopeful in how all of this gets integrated into our main lives and the mainstream when we return to quote unquote normal. I love that you've been thinking about that because um, it's definitely a big part of what we do at Cinema for All. It's, of course. it's in the name and you, you're right. I hope that whilst it's been a, a, a blessing to have these kind of online opportunities and we're going to screen the film in that way next week, which is super exciting. Um, yeah. Yeah, that we don't forget everybody that this is included and bring them in to us yes. in whatever sense we can. I love that. I wonder if you had a particular favorite cinema memory, whether it's re like fairly recent or from childhood that um, you'd be happy to share with us. Oh. Memory from childhood, I'm trying to think. I mean, one is kind of, can you just think for one second? I mean, no, you're fine. Take your time. It's always the ones that think, aren't necessarily the pivotal ones that you remember. <laughs> I, well, yes. The, <laughs> I, I, I will tell you one that I remember very vividly was going with my mother to see Pretty Woman. Oh, great. And I can't remember how old I was, but I wasn't old enough for whatever the rating was. And all of a sudden, I remember, I think it's kind of like, you know, a, a, a not that sexy sex scene between Richard Gere and Julia Roberts and my mother all of a sudden, you know, grabbing my head in the cinema and like pushing it down and me trying to squirm to see what she was hiding from me and trying to get out and her being like, just down so in a bit of a headlock. But that is, that's kind of um, a very, uh, limited one. I think the others that I really remember actually are also with her, but I think they're more, uh, or not think, they are more from much younger. They they are seeing um, Snow White and Seven Dwarves. They're seeing uh, Fantasia mm -hmm. in a cinema on a big screen as a little boy um, and kind of getting, just being in awe of, and not yet, not fully understanding um, but being in awe of this medium and this screen and this sound and this imagery and it all kind of going together and being pieced together in a certain way. I have a, I do remember that. That's probably, that's actually probably my earliest cinema memory. And then probably my most um, visceral is Pretty Woman. <laughs> Yeah, I love I love those both sides of that that coin there. I think you're right about when you, I can't imagine. To, I saw Fantasia on tape, and that was extremely immersive. It's so funny yeah. how cinema can speak to you to your senses first before your intellect sometimes, and right. you don't have a choice. It's take it's taking you with with it. Um, and that's what I and that's what I think. It's a great point because I think that is what, as a storyteller, that's that's the ball game to take. You know, you know, a caller had always said, you know, wrote a you know, willing suspension of disbelief. But I think that is when you're trying to tell a story, whether it's visually or or whether it's you know um, just telling a story in audio or whatever the case may be, you hope that for a moment, the participant, the viewer, the listener, gets transported out of their intellect. And into, and into the story. And with that, even if at the end of the day they walk away and they say, I didn't really like it that much, but it held me, you know, this particular point I was, you know, completely in, and then I kind of got pulled out or whatever the case may be, that to me is the real, that's the ball game. The ball game is, 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 a, is allowing people an hour or two hours of their life where they can escape reality and indulge and immerse themselves in the story that they're watching or listening to. And, and, and if you can do that, I think it's, I think it's a success. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think you've put that so eloquently. I think that's absolutely what we hope stories to do and why we constantly come back to them in every format. That's right. I just wondered if we could finish up with, if you can tell us about anything you're working on or ideas you've got, what you're allowed to maybe share. For ne- for I'm, not allowed to sh- I'm not allowed to share much. I will say I'm working, I've got um, three projects right now that are kind of going, uh, two documentary, well, yes, two documentary, one um, feature film. And hopefully in the next couple of months, I will have something to share and hopefully something in a short and not too long a time to bring bring back to you all, hopefully. Wonderful. Well, we'll definitely keep an eye out because I've absolutely loved the Capota tapes and really, really loved talking to you and hearing, oh, and hearing you talk about it. Thanks so much, Eves. Um, Thank you. Take care and uh, we'll, we'll see your work soon, I'm sure. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, bye, thank you.